17 year old Hannah Foster was murdered in the most horrific of ways after a night out with a friend, but searches for her killer revealed that he may have fled the country immediately after. Now, police felt helpless to do much more in the investigation, but that wasn't good enough for Hannah's parents. They took it upon themselves to try to bring their daughter's killer to justice themselves. They hopped on a plane and travelled the world to try to hunt him down and make him pay for Hannah's death. Before we get into the case, I just want to thank our sponsors for making this video possible, Magellan TV. The hidden gem of all streaming services, Magellan TV is documentary based and it has the best true crime selection. There's so many cases on there from all around the world, cases that I don't think I would have ever heard of if I hadn't found them on Magellan TV. For example, a documentary that I watched the other day was called Final Curtain. It was a South African case about a theatre star over there in South Africa. And at the time, his death was categorized as like a robbery gone wrong. However, years later, it was found that his death was due to much more sinister circumstances. It was so interesting and also another short one at 24 minutes. That's another thing I love about Magellan TV is that they have some of these shorter documentaries and I have the worst attention span ever in the world but I do want to still enjoy true crime and sometimes I just can't sit through a one hour documentary. So they have quite the selection of like shorter ones especially if you've only got like 20 minutes on a morning as you're getting ready. Pop one of those on you're good. Magellan add new content every single week so there's always going to be new stuff for you to check out. I've never gotten bored with my subscription and I've had it for years. So if you want to give it a try too, Magellan TV are very kindly offering you guys an exclusive deal when you go through my link. It's down below in the description of this video. Thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring. Quickly before we get into the case, I do just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. A couple of content warnings before we get into this case. This case does involve themes of rape and murder. So if you don't wanna hear about that right now, of course, click out of this video, go look after yourself. Hopefully I'll get a chance to see you some other time with a different video. But with all that being said, Let's get into the case. So today's case takes place in the 2000s in Southampton, which is a city on the south coast of England. That's where 17 year old Hannah Foster was born and lived her whole entire life. She was born on August 31st, 1985 to her parents, Hilary and Trevor, and she was later joined by a baby sister named Sarah. Hannah was a very sociable, happy, smiley girl all her life, like as a kid. And then this even shone through into her teenage years and then her growing up into a young woman. She was so, so generous. This was something that she was really known for was like her heart of gold. She was so generous and helpful and friendly and kind and just wanted to help people. That seemed to be one of the ways that Hannah was her happiest was when she was caring for people. And so it's no surprise that when she grew up, she wanted to become a doctor. She wanted to be able to care for people day in, day out for a living. That's what she wanted to dedicate her life to. And luckily it seemed doable for Hannah. She was very naturally intelligent. She had been all her life, but especially now that she was, you know, coming up to her A levels and stuff, her teachers really think she had it in her to be able to like go to medical school and pass with really good grades, which is no easy feat. You need flipping good grades to be able to do medicine. And Hannah knew that, but she was willing to do the hard work to get there. Outside of her studies, Hannah was still as sociable as ever. As she got into her teenage years, she went into A levels. She was about 16, 17, and she starts meeting up with her new college friends on weekends. And as she got a little bit older, maybe not quite old enough, but as she got to like 17 years old, a lot of these social gatherings would take place in pubs or bars. Hannah was only 17 at the time and the legal drinking age in the UK is 18. Places aren't allowed to serve anyone under the age of 18, but you know, some places, so we're, you know, we've all been 17 once. People had fake IDs, they would borrow other people's IDs, or you would just go to somewhere that you knew was a bit shady and would serve underage people. I'm not judging Hannah. 
I'm not. We've all been 17 once. But yeah, I think that was the situation. On March 14th, 2003, Hannah had gone out with her friend. It was a Friday night and they planned to just hit a couple of the pubs and bars in the area and see if anyone they knew was out and, you know, just have a couple of drinks. So at first they went into this pub called The Hobbit and it was a little bit boring in there. It proper was like pub vibes, you know, like older men in there. And these were two 17 year old girls and I think they had like one or two drinks and they were like, okay, moving on. So they left The Hobbit and they went to a place called So Bar, which is more like a bar. It's a bit more like club vibes as it gets later on. The girls were out until about 10.30 p.m., which is not that late at all. I think they just didn't end up running into anyone they knew and I don't know I think they were just they just weren't having the best time so they just called it a night early. So they left Sobar about 10 30 p.m and they walked to a nearby bus stop because Hannah's friend lived further away than her. Hannah only lived about half a mile away and she planned to walk it but her friend lived further so she waited for her friend until she got on the bus and then once that friend had gone, Hannah sat off walking home. And when the girls parted ways that night, Hannah Foster was never heard from again. Her parents first noticed that she hadn't made it home from her night out at about 5 a.m. I think one of them had like woken up in the middle of the night, gone to the bathroom and noticed that Hannah wasn't in bed. I'm not entirely sure of like the exact circumstances around this 5 a.m. moment, but her parents said that they knew at 5 a.m. that she wasn't home, but they were just kind of hoping that maybe she'd stayed at her friend's house or, I don't know, something. Maybe she was still out at 5 a.m. But um, either way, they just went back to bed and they waited to see her and hear from her in the morning. They did text her before they went to bed, just asking where she was and if she was all right, asking her to get in touch. Um, but when they woke up the next morning properly at about 10.30 a.m., there was still no response from Hannah, she still wasn't home, and at this point, her parents were sufficiently worried. So it was at this point that they called the police and reported their daughter as missing. Police came straight out to the house, they were talking to Hannah's parents. Meanwhile, another chunk of officers were literally going out and walking the streets, walking the route that she would have taken home from town that night. And as that was going on, they had another chunk of officers going door to door, like asking neighbors if they'd seen from her or heard from her. No one had though absolutely no one. And as all of that was going on, police were really going full force with this investigation straight away. I mean, they always do when it's a minor that goes missing, but yeah, they were really putting all of their manpower into this. They had people in all different sections. Plus, back at the police station, they were trying to track down Hannah Foster's mobile phone. Because her parents had, of course, been like texting her and trying to call her, seeing where she is. And these texts and calls were actually going through. So that meant that her phone was still on. It was receiving these texts and calls, but she just wasn't answering them. And of course, whenever a phone receives a text or a call, it pings off the nearest cell tower. So from this, they could tell the location of Hannah's phone at all these different times when her parents had texted and called her. And actually it seemed as though Hannah was moving through these locations in quite like quick succession. So they theorized that either Hannah or her phone had been in a car that night. Well, like in the early hours of the morning. But what was even more concerning was when police managed to get her full phone records from the night that she went missing and they found that she'd actually tried to make a 999 call from her mobile phone that night. So she'd called 999 on her mobile phone and successfully gotten through to an operator but the operator said that this call, like no one said anything. All they could hear was just like a bit of movement. Of course, this whole time the operator is trying to talk to the person on the other end of the phone because you never know what's happening on the other end. It could be someone in danger or alternatively, someone could have just butt dialed 999 by accident. And so to tell the difference between someone that can't speak but needs help versus an accidental call. They play this um, like audio message after 30 seconds of no response from the caller. It's called the silent solution system. So if the person on the other end of the phone doesn't talk for the first like 30 seconds of the call, then it will get passed to this automated message 
that essentially says like, you haven't said anything. If you need the police's help, please press five five now and we'll know that you need help, but you can't talk on the phone. I don't think anything at all was pressed before Hannah Foster's line cut off. I don't think she even managed to listen to the whole silent solutions thing before the phone line cut. So all police really had to go on was this pretty silent phone call. Although it wasn't silent, there was like some murmuring in the background, which they originally thought was movement, but they actually took this call and like enhanced it, run it through all these different programs and whatever. And they figured out that this noise was actually a voice. They couldn't figure out absolutely everything that was said, but from what they could hear, they managed to identify an older South Asian man. He had a South Asian accent. And of course they couldn't hear absolutely everything that he was saying, but at points they heard him telling Hannah to keep her head down. And this confirmed everyone's worst fears that they can hear this man telling her to keep her head down and her car, her phone was in a moving vehicle. It all points to the fact that she was kidnapped. The last place that Hannah Foster's phone was picked up on a cell tower was about 5 a.m. the next morning and it was all the way in Portsmouth. So one thing police decided to do to try and figure out who had Hannah and where they were taking her, they decided to look at CCTV cameras of different motorways when Hannah's phone was pinged on cell towers nearby. Does that make sense? Because that sounded really confusing to me and it was coming out of my own mouth. Basically, they said, like, okay, Portsmouth cell tower dinged at 5 a.m. Let's check all the motorways in that section at 5 a.m. to see if we can spot, you know, patterns between these different cell towers. Say they saw the exact same car in each place at each time, they would know what vehicle Hannah was abducted in. And that is exactly what they managed to do. They saw this exact same van in every single like area where Hannah's phone was. Although the annoying thing was they couldn't quite make out like the exact license plate. They just kind of knew what kind of van it was. Um, and it was, luckily though, it was only one of like 10 in the country. Not that many. I don't know whether that makes it easier or harder for police, probably easier. So all of this, all of that that I just said to you all happened in the first day of this investigation. It was a very, very big, first day. Police were working around the clock to try and find out where Hannah was, to try and find her abductor and hopefully get her back alive. But just 24 hours into the investigation, police received the worst news possible. A young girl's dead body had been discovered in some bushes on the side of the road in Southampton and Hannah was the only young girl reported missing in that area. The body was recovered and taken to the morgue where it was very quickly identified as that of 17 year old Hannah Foster. She'd been very clearly beaten and strangled to death. She had had a brutal murder. A brutal murder that ended with her body being ditched on the side of the road in some bushes. And as things developed, it just got more and more heartbreaking. When the autopsy was done on her body, it was revealed that Hannah had been raped before her death. Her attacker's DNA was extracted from her body and it was tested on the criminal database to see if they had a match, see if they could identify her killer, but nothing came up. So it seems as though Hannah's killer wasn't a previous violent criminal, or at least they hadn't been caught for anything in the past. It was quite frustrating when no name came back from this DNA test because, well, it always is. DNA is such a slam dunk piece of evidence if you have a match. And it's it, it must be so frustrating to have that and not be able to get your match. But the very next day, police got another development in this case when a nearby recycling plant had found a bunch of Hannah's belongings in, well, in all the recycling that they'd been sent to sort through. I think it was her bag and her phone that were found and her attacker must not have realized that they were putting them in a recycling bin because realistically that, that is so stupid. Cause surely if you're trying to literally get rid of evidence and make sure it never surfaces again, would you not put it in a normal bin where all the rubbish is gonna go to landfill? Why would you put it in a recycling bin when you know that that's all gonna go to a recycling plant and literally get sorted through by real people? Like individual people are gonna 
pick up the parts and go, yes, this is plastic or no, this is a bag. To be fair, I don't know if that's exactly how recycling plants work, but of course they were gonna get found if you're putting them in a recycling bin and neither of these things are recyclable. In the days following this discovery, Hannah Foster's case was aired on Crime Watch, which was an old British TV show that I have rather fond memories of. It's quite an interesting concept. It's centered around ongoing real true crime cases and like unsolved cases that were happening in the UK at the time. And they would make these recreations, reconstructions of certain parts of cases that they knew about to try to jog people's memory. This show just kind of served as something to help solve crimes in the UK. I thought it was really cool. I, I remember watching this quite a lot in my childhood. It doesn't exist anymore, which is quite sad. But yeah, Hannah's case was featured on Crime Watch. They recreated her walk home, I believe, and they basically just gave the public all the information that they already had on this case, where she was, at what time, what she was wearing that night, anything that could try jog people's memory of what they could have seen that night. To be fair, a lot of the Crime Watch episode concentrated on that van because they had these CCTV pictures of this van. It was like a big silver and white van. And of course it was believed to be quite a rare model, I think. So they were really pushing this on the episode being like, does anyone recognize this van? And luckily someone rang in to say, actually, <laughs> I think that could be my sandwich delivery man's van. I don't know the specifics of this call that came into the police. I believe it was a shop owner though. I think it was a shop owner that used to get deliveries in of like pre-packed sandwiches from this place called Hazelwood Foods. And he said that the delivery van that this sandwich delivery guy would always come and drop the sandwiches off in was exactly the same as that van that was seen on all those CCTV things. And so this guy was calling up saying, hey, I think your abductor is my sandwich delivery guy. So they get in touch with this sandwich delivery company and they start looking into all the employees that had these vans and would have been working in that area. And they find this one particular employee who had been seeming very suspicious in the last like week or so. And actually the day after Hannah's abduction, so before anyone really knew about it, of course like her family and the police knew about it, but it wasn't like, you know, nationwide news or anything. The next morning, this one particular employee turns up at his sandwich delivery job with scratches, fresh scratches all over his face. And he's complaining of a really bad back, like a really aching back to the point where he has to go home early. Like he can't stay at work, he's in that much pain. So now all of this is starting to line up. This person's van was seen in the same places as Hannah's he was also working in that area on the afternoon that Hannah went missing, so he could have just been lingering in that area for all we knew. Plus the scratches on his face, I mean, come on, like, obviously. So police start looking into this guy. He was 41 year old husband and father of two, Maninda Pal Singh Kohli. He was originally from India, but he'd been living there in Southampton for about eight years at this point. He'd actually moved over to the UK because of an arranged marriage that he was having to this British born Indian woman, which I believe he found through a newspaper ad, which I don't know how normal or how unnormal that is. To me, that sounds rather unnormal, but that's because that's not my culture. I don't know how common it is to just like go in a newspaper and go, yep, that one will do. But that's what they did. Um, and he moved over to the UK, got married to this woman. They had two children together. And that's kind of all we really know about Maninda because obviously because most of his life was lived over in India. We don't have like the documentation and the stories of all of that. All we really know is the eight years leading up to this point in the case. So that was just like wife and kid territory, isn't it? Actually, uh, we do know a little bit more outside of that because by day, he was this very like dedicated family man. He was all about his wife, all about his kids. But by night, he had a lot of vices. He would drink a lot. Like he would get drunk in the pub on a night and he would have to try and hide it from his wife. I think his wife knew to a degree that he was doing all of this. I say all of this because there's more than drinking, by the way. He was smoking, not just cigarettes, you know? He was gambling. He would cheat on his wife all the time. That part I don't think she did know about. But yeah, he really had this like 
double life. He had this dark side. But that kind of is all we know about Meninda. That's kind of all his life really consisted of since he'd moved to the UK. But anyway, police start looking into Menanda Palsing Curley as a suspect in Hannah's rape and murder. And very quickly, they were able to confirm that his sandwich delivery van is the van that was seen on CCTV. They got this evidence so quickly. They were also able to track the route that Meninda's van took on the night of Hannah's murder and for the hours following it, you know, they wanted to see what he was doing afterwards. And they found that the very last place that Hannah's phone pinged was in this like random car park somewhere. And then when they pulled up the security footage, they saw Meninda's van going in there and parking near a recycling bin. So that explains why Hannah's phone stopped there. That was where he ditched the phone in the bag and then continued off. I think he just went back home to his family that next day. So police managed to seize Maninda's exact van, you know, from his sandwich delivery company. And the first thing they did was send it off for forensic testing. On initial searches of this van, it was literally one of the first things they found. They found a carrier bag that had a metal bat inside it that had blood and long hairs on it. Literally one of the first things they find in that van, it seems like this was a, a murder weapon or maybe not a murder weapon actually because her cause of death was strangulation, but this seemed like it was a weapon that was used at some point during this attack. When Hannah's body was found, she was beaten and strangled. So it seemed that this was the exact weapon that Meninda had been using to beat her with. When the forensic searches of like the actual van itself came back, they found blood DNA and semen DNA in there, both of which matched the DNA samples that were taken from Hannah Foster's dead body. So the semen matched semen from the van, so obviously it's gonna be Meninda's. Who else is who else is ejaculating in your work van? You know what I mean? You can't you can't argue that that's anyone else's. And the blood evidence matched too. I think it was Hannah's blood that was found in his van and then you know, also on herself. So all of this is concrete proof that Meninda Palsing Curley is Hannah Foster's rapist and murderer. All of this is such concrete proof. Police thought they had absolutely everything that they could possibly need to charge this man with the murder. So they went down to his house to go and arrest him. But when they got there, he was gone. The house was completely empty. It seemed as though everyone was gone, not just Meninda, but his wife, their two kids, no one was there. So police tried their best to try and locate any of them. They were looking into like close family, you know, parents, grandparents. They made their way to his wife's parents' house and they found the wife and two kids there staying with her parents. First of all, why? Second of all, where's Meninda? His wife told the police that Meninda's mother back over in India was gravely ill and she'd just taken a turn for the worse. And so Meninda had immediately hopped on a plane to India to go out and be with his dying mother. So now police had confirmation that this man had fled the country, fled the entire continent. He'd gone over to Asia, which by the way, has a significantly larger population than the UK. It's easier to blend into a crowd in India, in Delhi specifically. So now police back in the UK are like, shit, he's in a different country. So they get in touch with the police in that country. They explain the whole situation. We've had this rape and murder of this young girl and it seems the murderer has run to India. Can you please help us solve this and get hold of him and then we can come and extradite him, all of this. And Indian police were just kind of like, we don't have time. We don't have time or energy or resources or anything. Like I said, India's population is significantly larger than ours. They have significantly more crime, I guess, just by just by ramping up the numbers of people, you're gonna ramp up the numbers of crimes. And there were not enough police in India to even be combating the amount of crimes that they had there themselves. They were having women and young girls being abducted, raped, murdered almost every day in some capacity at some place in India. And you know, this was just, it sounds awful to say, but this was just another case for them. It It's like, they, they couldn't exactly prioritize Hannah Foster's murder from a different country over these ones in their country that they were actively trying to solve. Some people have their own theories that the 
the whole unbotheredness when it comes to Hannah Foster's case could be due to the fact that Maninda Palsing Curley's brother was a police officer in Delhi. But yeah, despite being very much aware of what Maninda was being accused of and the fact that there was so much evidence to say that he definitely did it, Indian police just, they just weren't in a rush to try and find him. They did, they did nothing. For a whole year, after this, it was as if the investigation totally froze. No further developments, no progress, absolutely nothing. The assailant had quite literally gotten away with it. He, he, he'd gone and there was nothing that the UK police could do to get justice for Hannah Foster. Hannah's family were left to grieve their daughter knowing that her killer was living a normal life over in Delhi, getting away with her murder and there was nothing that they could do about it and they felt so heartbroken and frustrated over this whole thing. It felt like no one wanted to get justice for their baby. And trust me, I firmly believe that all of Maninda's family were fighting to keep him out of jail. I mean, his brother, the police officer, would always insist that his brother was framed. And so did his wife back home, actually. His wife was insisting to police officers that they have the wrong man, they're looking in the wrong place and they should be focusing their efforts somewhere else, somewhere where it's gonna work. Literally no one related to Maninda was being cooperative or helpful or even honest with themselves, like, Look at all of this evidence piling up, the, the DNA in the van, everything, and you're saying, no, someone's framed him. So a whole year goes by in this case, and Hannah's family are very aware of who their daughter's killer is. Everyone is. Everyone knows that it is Maninda Palsing Corley, but he's just uncatchable at this moment in time. And Hannah's family were getting so frustrated that in the end they were like, why, why don't we just try and do this ourselves? If no one else is gonna help us, if no police force out there is willing to go and apprehend this man, let's go see what we can do ourselves. So Hannah's parents, Hilary and Trevor, hopped on a plane and flew out to India. And for the next 10 days, they'd planned a 10 day trip there and the whole thing was gonna consist of them campaigning, handing out leaflets, trying to get on the news, trying to do public appeals, trying to, explain to the whole of India their situation and how much they need the community's help to bring this man to justice. They did quite a few of these TV appeals and it really did hook the whole nation of India. Like people responded really well to this emotion, the raw emotion that they were seeing on TV. I mean, Sadly, you hear about cases like this a lot, but now to see this one particular case on the TV and see this devastated mother and father crying about the loss of their daughter and they know who did this, but they can't bring him to justice, it made everyone else emotional for them. It made everyone else angry. It made everyone else want to help to solve this case. So a hotline was set up, a phone number that people could ring if they were watching these public appeals and they had any information to give over to the police. And after a while, they got their first big lead from a member of the public. A taxi driver phoned in to say that he recognized Meninda. He would get in his taxi quite a lot. He was like a regular customer. And through these regular rides, this driver had gotten to know Meninda quite well, or should we say, Mike Dennis, because Meninda was going under a fake name while he was staying there in India. He was Mike Dennis. But everything else that he told this taxi driver about himself was true. He said that he was originally from the UK, but he was over here in India for about a week to visit family. He said that he was there on holiday, but then he just eventually ended up staying, I guess. Yeah, he told the taxi driver about his wife and kids at home and like he would tell all these stories about him. It, like, it was like he was Meninda just with a different name and he was just living as he always had done. One thing this taxi driver said about Meninda, which I found very interesting, was that he used to get a newspaper every morning and he used to just flick through the headlines, barely read anything, and then he'd be done reading within like, three minutes. He was literally just flicking through, reading the headlines to see if anything about his own crime was coming up. Well, at least that's my theory. Maybe he was just not very interested in any of the news ever. For the rest of the week, different tips and calls kept coming into this hotline and police were getting more and more of an idea 
of where Menindapal Singh Kohli was at this point in time and what he was up to and what his life was like. So they found out that Mike Dennis got a job at a Red Cross centre because he'd lied about being a doctor. Menindapal Singh Kohli had no medical qualifications, no medical, um, Oh, what's the word? Experience. He literally lied to the Red Cross saying that he was a doctor from the World Health Organization and that he had been sent there to administer vaccinations to the children, to the local children. They were letting this man put needles in children's arms and he had not a fucking clue what he was doing. They managed to get more and more tips as time was going on about Meninda or Mike's whereabouts. And it seemed that he was edging closer and closer to the Nepal border, which was a very scary thing for the police. Let me explain why. Nepal didn't have an extradition treaty with India or the UK, I think, at this point in time. Maybe they still don't, but I know definitely at the time of this case, there was no extradition treaty, which meant that if Maninda stepped foot in Nepal, he couldn't be extradited back out of there to get, you know, to get put into prison elsewhere. He couldn't. So as far as he was concerned, the second he steps over into Nepal, he's gotten away with murder. He can never get like captured and forced to go into prison as long as he's in Nepal. And he's edging closer and closer as the days are going by and police are getting really panicked because if they don't beat him to the border, then that's it. They're never gonna solve this case. They're never gonna get Hannah any justice. So they managed to get this one very important tip that Meninda had been seen going to a relative's house that was about 30 minutes from the Nepal border. So police kind of knew like, shit, it's now or never, let's go, let's try and get to this relative's house. But where all of this case had been going on, I think it was all going on in Delhi, like all the investigations. So it was gonna take Delhi police who were on this case ages to, well not ages, but like some time to drive to the Nepal border. It just wasn't very efficient and they knew that time was of the essence. So the police in Delhi called the police like closer to the area and they were like, look, I know you know nothing about this, but we've got this case of this guy that has killed a girl over in the UK and now he's here in India and he is about to cross over to Nepal. We need you to be on our side. We need you to try and get this guy. I know you don't know what he looks like, but try. The only description that they could give these other police officers about Meninda was that he was wearing a red top. He had a shaven beard and he was walking with a woman. I think he'd like cut his hair. He was wearing his hair differently or something like that. He wasn't wearing a headscarf anymore, something. And of course he'd shaved his beard. He used to have a really big beard here in the UK and he'd like shaved that as soon as he went to India. There was a lot about his appearance that he was intentionally trying to change. So yeah, when police <laughs> called up these other police officers and they were like, go arrest the man in a red shirt, they were like, <laughs> okay, I'll try my best. But incredibly, even with this very naff description, an undercover police officer actually spotted Maninda and the woman about to board a bus to Nepal. They were literally on the home stretch. Had they gotten on that bus, they would have gotten into Nepal and been free forever. But this undercover police officer spotted them pulled them away from the bus and detained them. So both of them were arrested and taken back to the police station. And this woman, by the way, was Meninda's new wife, or shall I say Mike Dennis's new wife. And this new wife had no idea who Meninda really was and that he had another wife back in the UK. And of course that wife back in the UK had no idea that he was completely living a new life over in India now and had a new wife and a new job. He would literally constructed a whole new life for himself from scratch. He had this new name, the new job at the Red Cross, which is actually heinous that they managed to give this man with absolutely no qualifications or history or records or anything. They were like, yeah, take all these needles, shove them in our children. That is one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. I mean, I know it's probably quite desperate work giving kids vaccinations actually. That was me having that realization in real time. I guess they are quite desperate for workers, but oh my God, the fact that this man raped and murdered a young girl and then went to go give loads of vaccinations to kids. It, it's creepy and it's disturbing and it makes me feel ill. But I think I just went off on a tangent actually. So Meninda and his new wife are arrested and brought to the police station. I think the new wife is very quickly 
released. I don't think she really knew much of anything, like obviously about Meninda's past life and what he'd done in the UK. I really don't think she knew why they were like going to Nepal, but she was down for it because this is her husband. Meanwhile, Meninda is in his police interrogation and he is actually very forthcoming, very cooperative. He actually told the police that he was tired of running now, so he was ready to tell them everything. But we'll get into everything that he has to tell them in a second. I just want to go back to Hannah's family because that's one of the most extraordinary things I've ever heard in a true crime case is victims' family wanting, being so frustrated at the little progress going on in the investigation that they literally set about solving the case themselves. I just think it's incredible. I think Hannah's parents are, are such incredible people. They were literally only over there in India for about five or six days campaigning before this arrest happened. And truly they didn't expect it to happen that quick. If anything, it could have never happened at all. So the fact that it happened so quickly was amazing. They knew going to India that the chances of them coming back successful were very, very slim but they were willing to do it because, well, they were willing to do anything to try and get some justice for their daughter. And incredibly, it worked. Her mum and dad helped to find her killer. It is very upsetting that the victim's own family had to be the ones to put in all this time and effort and literally spend their own money flying across the world to a different continent to try and find this man. That should be the police's job. Police should have done that for them. But honestly, I think this case would have never been solved had Hannah's parents not traveled over there when they did. They literally got there just in time. They planned this trip just in time and they had no idea that they literally just caught him within the last 30 minutes that he was gonna be in that country. So, Meninda Pal Singh Curley is now in police custody. And like I said, he was ready to tell police everything. Actually, I done a crime over there. That's why I, you know, ran from there to come in here. What happened? I, I abduct, raped and killed Hannah Foster. Why are you admitting this to the media? Why are you admitting this now? I did, because I am already too tired, you know, the, to run here and there, here and there. And I want to unburden myself totally want to tell that truth. So because he very much confessed, it was very easy to charge him and send this case to trial. But by the time it got to the trial, Meninda Pal Singh Kohli was considerably less cooperative than he once had been. His brother, remember the highly esteemed police officer in Delhi, he was going on the news literally saying that the British police were trying to frame his brother, his brother was totally innocent, British police were trying to frame him because he was Asian. He said that that's, that's the only reason, not because of the blood and the semen in his car or Hannah's hair on a bat in his van. Someone should have definitely shown that brother the confession tapes from his police interrogation because don't he look a bit silly now? Imagine, imagine saying with your chest, my brother is innocent, you're framing him. Meanwhile, there's a video of your brother going, yeah, I confess. So, Meninda was being held over in India and his legal team was based in India and everything and they were just waiting to get him extradited to the UK. Oh, so actually he hadn't been charged yet. Sorry, I, I think I lied earlier. He was arrested earlier, but he couldn't get charged until, well, it had to be UK police officers that charged him, I believe, because it was them on the case. So he was waiting over in India with his legal team and they were trying everything to stall his extradition. They didn't want to get him back over to the UK, kind of because they knew as soon as he gets to the UK, he's done for, like he's getting charged and he's going to prison. So they were trying to just, I don't know, drag their heels and keep him in India for as long as they could. Meninda faked a couple of illnesses to like get out of different trial dates and whatever. His legal team, certain members wouldn't show up to certain hearings so that legally they can't go forward if this person's not there to oversee everything. You know, they were, they were really trying absolutely everything they could. Over the whole time that Meninda was being held in India, they had about a hundred court proceedings and at least like 20 appeals. 
all of which were rejected. I don't know what all these bloody court appearances were about, but anyway. This went on for three years, by the way. I don't think I emphasized just how long they were stalling and dragging their heels for. Three years. So Hannah's mum and dad have just had that relieving moment of finding their daughter's killer and getting him arrested and getting things moving, only for things to pause for another three years. I can't imagine how heartbreaking and frustrating this whole thing must have been for Hannah Foster's family. Like, I imagine once it got to like a year of him being stuck in India, I bet they were thinking the same as they were thinking before, like, shit, this is actually never gonna be solved. I know that that's how I'd probably be thinking, but I'm quite a pessimistic person. But I just imagine going through that same thing again, you'd be like, fuck, we're never gonna solve this. But finally, in October of 2008, British police got the all clear to go over to India collect Meninder Pal Singh Curley and charge him, finally, with the rape and murder of Hannah Foster. He was brought back to the UK where he was charged, he was taken to the police station, and actually one of the police officers heard him saying, you win some, you lose some. Which is so disgusting, I presume his loss is the fact that he's been caught and he's going to jail, but what did you win? The murder? Or the fact that you managed to get away with the murder for a while? What is the win? in this situation. So at his trial, the prosecution laid out the events on the night of Hannah Foster's abduction, and it goes as such. That evening, Meninder was drinking in a pub called The Mitre. He was alone and he was very drunk, he said. He'd gone on his way home from work, so he'd gone like in the sandwich delivery van, he'd just parked it on the road and gone into this pub, and he was planning to come back out and drive home in that van after admitting that he was very, very drunk. At this same time, Hannah and her friend were in Sobar and about 10.30, they decide to leave and they go to the bus stop. Hannah sees her friend onto the bus and then she went to do the rest of her walk home on foot alone and it was very quickly after she'd separated from her friend that Meninda spotted Hannah walking alone. He'd finished up his night and left the pub to go and get back in his van and that was when he'd spotted Hannah, pretty much as soon as he came out of the pub. And it seems like he made the very, very quick decision that he was gonna harm Hannah. It was like he saw her and then he kind of jumped straight into action. There was no thinking time at all. There was no going over it in his head or anything. He jumped in that van and he seized this opportunity. So he'd already noticed that Hannah was walking in one particular direction and he decided to drive his van past her and then park up in front of her so that when she eventually caught up walking, she would line up with his van and then he could jump out of the van and grab her. And that's exactly what he did. When Hannah got up close to his van, he grabbed her, dragged her into the back of the van where he then proceeded to rape her. A conversation did happen somewhat between Meninda and Hannah, but Meninda has never really gone into this conversation much more than he said that Hannah refused to keep this a secret. So he told her that she couldn't go to the police about it and she was refusing. She was kind of saying that she was gonna go to the police, she was gonna report this. And Meninda said that it was when Hannah was saying that to him that he realized that he couldn't leave her alive because she was gonna get him into a lot of trouble. And so that was when he decided to beat and strangle her to death. I don't know where the beatings came into this. I presume it was when she was still alive. Maybe he was trying to beat her into submission to not tell the police maybe. But he described the strangulation part to police. He said that he was behind her and he grabbed her neck into his elbow and then he covered her mouth and her nose with his other hand and he held her until her body went limp and she died. He then left Hannah Foster's dead body in the back of his van, right? Went and got in the driver's seat and just drove back home with this dead body in the back of his car. He parked up on his driveway where he lived with his wife and two children inside that house and he just walked into that house as if it was a normal evening. He just left a, a corpse in his vehicle overnight. And actually, believe it or not, he told his wife that there was a dead body in his van, but he had a story. He said it wasn't his doing, it wasn't, it wasn't his dead body. Um, he'd been out drinking in the pub and then he came out and noticed that someone had broken into his van and left a dead body in there. What? 
I've never heard of that happening before in my life. Meninda tells his wife that he just he just didn't know what to do. There was a dead body in his van, so he decides to close the door and just drive it home and think about it later. What the actual F? If, if that had happened, the most unbelievable story ever, by the way, if you had gone back to your car and just found a dead body there, you're calling the police. You're not closing the door and be like, shit, better get rid of this body by myself now. But that's exactly what Meninda thought. For some reason, he was telling his wife that like, don't worry, I'll get rid of this body tomorrow. Like I'll figure out how to get rid of it. I won't get in trouble. What? What? And his wife believes all of this, by the way. She believes this story that Meninda came home to her saying that someone else put that body in his van. And so still, well, the last time she was asked, she stood by him. She believed that he was being framed by this other evil person that had put the dead body in his van. So all of that story that I just told you, like, actually happened. It's all facts that the prosecution laid out based on the evidence and based on what we know, even based on Meninda's uh, confession that he seems to have forgotten that he gave. But even though all of that was fact, Meninda actually had a different story to tell all of a sudden, one that he hadn't told once so far. He stood up there in court and said that the only reason that he abducted and raped and murdered Hannah Foster was because a gang was telling him to do it. That's right, a gang forced this man to come out of the pub and abduct, rape and murder this young girl and then ditch her body. No, no they didn't. That's He'd never mentioned this once before. Why are you only bringing this up in court? I don't know why murderers and just criminals in general think that they can do that. It's like, if you mention something for the first time in your court trial, no one's gonna believe it because where has this information been for the past, for years, for literal years, where has this information been? Of course, no one believed his story that he was forced by a gang to commit rape. Like, that's not a thing. That's not something that gangs do. In the end, Meninda Pal Singh Curley was found guilty of all of the charges against him. And for all of that, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 24 years. He's expected to remain in prison until like 2030, which is only another seven years. And he is expected to be released when he's around the age of 63 which really scares me, particularly with this case. I mean, that scares me at the best of times when they release murderers too early, but particularly this one because he's never once shown any ounce of remorse or reasoning or absolutely anything. And also just the nature of this crime is so, so scary that he just walked out of a pub, saw this girl and within a split second decided, okay, I'm gonna abduct, rape, murder her and then ditch her body. That is just evil. That is plain evil. And a person like that should not be walking the streets. I also question just personally from researching this case, I question if this was his first and only murder. I mean, what's to say that he hadn't done something very similar to this before this point? People don't usually commit their first heinous abduction, rape and murder at the age of 41. People that have, people that are capable of committing such heinous crimes will do it at a younger age if they're interested in it. All I'm saying is, I personally would not be surprised if we were to find out that Meninda Pal Singh Kohli had done something similar to another girl in India before he'd moved to the UK. Maybe there was a reason he moved to the UK. Maybe he was planning on marrying in India and living in India forever, but maybe something happened that made him have to move and run away. Who knows? But that is all I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching as always. And thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you go through the link down below in the description of this video, there'll be an exclusive deal waiting there for you. I love Magellan TV. I know that you guys will too. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting the channel and helping me decide the cases that I cover. All of my tier two members are on screen right now. So thank you so much. If you wanna become a channel member, you can click the join button down below. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up down below. That would really help me out. It helps boost the video in the algorithms and stuff. So if you enjoy my content, that's a nice way to support me. Um, if you want to watch another one of my videos, I'll leave you one on screen right now. Click this one. I picked it out specially for you. Or you can click this circle with my face in because that, uh, that's how you subscribe to my channel, by the way. And I post these true crime videos all the time, so you don't want to miss them. Anyway, bye.